Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the ASTO-supported Primary Care Public Health Collaborative All Partners Call. During today's presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode during the presentation. However, afterwards, you may unmute your line by pressing 66 on your phone and 63 to mute it again. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Monday, June 23rd, 2014. I would now like to turn the conference over to Dr. Paul Jarris. Please go ahead, doctor. Thank you, and welcome all to the ASTO-supported Primary Care Public Health Collaborative All Partners Call. I appreciate your joining us uh, either by phone or on the web. Um, we will uh, have slides that we'll be going through and felt it was easier to do it uh, on a webinar this time than just verbally since we're going through some visual materials. So again, thanks for joining. Um, the agenda today briefly, a little welcome, and then we'll go through um, an overview of the strategic map which has been updated recently. Um, and then uh, following that, ask you for some input uh, both from the committees and stakeholders uh, to the strategic map. Um, it is not yet finalized and will be. Um, and then we'll talk about some next steps. So again, thanks for coming uh, onto the call. As we um, get started, there's a couple of announcements we'd like to make. Uh, one is we want to thank Denise Koo for um, her co-chairing the Education Committee over the past year. The committee has done some, some great work. Um, Denise has taken an assignment at the CDC Policy Office, so she's no longer in the workforce area. Um, so she will be working on community health needs assessments and other areas in the policy office. We want to thank for all she did um, for the committee, co-chairing with Yumi Jarris. And we're pleased to announce that uh, Dr. Donna Peterson um, will be now co-chairing the Workforce Committee with Yumi. Uh, Donna is Dean of the College of Public Health and a Senior Associate Vice President um, at the USF, uh, for USF Health at the University of South Florida in Tampa. He's also the chair of the Education Committee for the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health. Um, and in that capacity, she serves as the chair of the Framing the Futures Task Force over the last several years. That was an effort to transform education and public health um, over or for the next 100 years. She's also a member of the Council on Education for Public Health, which is the accreditation body for schools and programs, and was a founder of the National Board of Public Health Examiners. Um, so uh, Donna is a, really an icon in her field, and we're very happy to have her joining us on the workforce call um, the committee, um, and we expect to continue to have great things out of that committee. So Donna, thank you very much. And um, if you're on the line, Donna, um, you can unmute and say hello, or perhaps uh, I do see Donna on the line. Can we unmute her? Donna, if you're on the line, please press 6-6 six on your phone now. Paul. Hello, Paul? Anna? Yes, we have you here on the Hi. line. Yeah, Hi. I'm here. Hi. Yes. Good. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> no, you're welcome. So we just wanted to say hello and, and welcome to the uh, collaborative. I appreciate being a part of this. I'm glad I could be on the call and uh, good morning, everybody. Good. Thanks. Are there any other new organizations on the call who have not been on a call before that would like to announce themselves? And you would need to hit, was that star 6-6 six, six operator? Almost. Uh, you, to right. unmute your line, please press 6-6 six, six on your phone and 6-3 again later to mute it again. Hi, this is Tom Land from the uh, Department of Public Health in Massachusetts. Oh, very good, Tom. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, right. Paul. This is Chris Kinnebrew from the National Network of Public Health Institutes. Excellent, Chris. Um, Appreciate your joining us. Uh, that yeah, thanks for the invitation. Sure thing. Are there other new organizations on the line? Uh, this is Judy Chaconas from the Division of Public Health in Delaware. Excellent. Welcome, Delaware. Thank you. This is David Sundwall from Utah. I'm hardly new. <laughs> we don't have to say that then, do we? So, hello, David. <laughs> <laughs> Any other new organizations uh, on the line? Very good. Well, thank you. Um, so as, as you all know, two years ago, 
uh, a little over two years ago, following the IOM release of the report on the integration of public health and primary care, um, several of us began speaking about taking that report and extending it um, from largely the, an important focus on HRSA and CDC collaboration and really looking at uh, collaboration at the level of, of uh, academics and practitioners in public health and primary care. So uh, we are fortunate um, to work with um, Alina and Rose Martinez at the IOM and co-convene a strategic planning session, which is a strategic map that you will see again in a moment and that we've been using over the past two years. Uh, it became clear over the past two years as we got more and more into the work that it was time to really re-update that strategic map um, and uh, get the group together uh, to learn from the last two years and project what we should be doing next. So as you can see on your screen now, a broad-based group of individuals came together um, from professional medical societies, universities, state health officials, there were a number of foundations, public health organizations, and uh, very strong federal participation, uh, as well as the co-chairs of our committees to spend a couple days uh, together looking at what have we learned and where should we go in the next two years. We're in the process now of vetting that strategic map so um, someone has been presenting the strategic map to each of the committees so the committees can consider them. And also on this all show call, on this all uh, partners call, we're asking you to take a look at the map and give us your comments on whether you feel this is the appropriate direction to go in in the next two years um, as, we, as we begin to, to fill this out. So over the next uh, month or so, we will be receiving that feedback and finalizing the map which then, of course, will uh, help us determine um, the direction the um, uh, collaborative goes in the future, including the structure of the collaborative. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Sharon Moffat and ask Sharon if she would begin to walk us uh, through the map and the process so that you're familiar with it. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Sharon Moffat. Um, so what I want to do is take you through uh, some of the key uh, changes in this uh, new draft map. And wh what I will also say is we're going to have time for uh, questions. So again, remind you uh, as we're going through this, if you could put your questions in the chat box, that will help us in making sure we're prepared uh, to respond. Also, uh, after I finish, uh, I'll be turning back to Paul to see if he has any additions. And also, to uh, Tim Fallon, who is really instrumental in helping us facilitate both the first strategic map but also the second. So uh, as you will see, we've, um, if you look just broadly at this new map, you'll see we have gone from uh, five strategic objective areas, uh, those are the blue boxes, to now three. And I, I think as Tim reminds us well, is often in the first round of work on the strategic map, your work can be very broad. And it's really the experience over time that gets you to put a finer point on this. And I would say that was one of the experiences that came out of our meeting in May as we focused on this work. So the next um, slide I'm going to take you to is one that really looks at the central challenge. And we had quite a bit of discussion about this central challenge, and particularly what we thought was the role of this collaborative was around accelerating immigration. That that was a, a critical uh, terminology rather than just implementing or, or being an implementer of integration, that really it was our collective work together was to accelerate those efforts to improve population health and lower health costs. The next uh, area I want to uh, really spend some time focusing, have, bringing your focus attention to is what we call the strategic priorities. As I mentioned, we went from five broad areas to uh, now three very focused areas. Um, first, to accelerate in integration, particularly through innovation and dissemination. And you'll see under uh, column A, we'll, we'll be getting to that, but there are a lot of particular action steps that we talked about related to how we uh, achieve that strategic priority. The next strategic priority is leverage initiatives and opportunities for integration. 
And then the third uh, strategic area, or if you will, the C column, is expand and strengthen the collaboration and integration. And let me just uh, point out, particularly with um, columns B and C, there was a considerable amount of talk, and I think you'll see in the actions that uh, fall under these areas, that there needed to be work both in, within the collaborative itself, so internally focusing on how do we strengthen and create the, a strong infrastructure for the collaborative, and then outward focus facing, which is really looking at how do we, with external partners at multiple different levels, actually achieve uh, the collaborative. So when we have comments, that's an area that we'd like your uh, continued thoughts on. Uh, so Sharon, next, can, I, can I jump yes, in one second yes, sure. there? Because um, sure. um, we can go back to one slide. The um, There we go. Oh. <laughs> All right, you do it. I won't do it. There. Um, the, if you look at the, the street party B, um, the, the folks working on this are fully aware of how much is going on in the sphere of integration between healthcare and public health and primary care and public health. Um, and there was a real recognition that what we would like to do as um, one of those initiatives going on is as much as possible be aware of the multiple other initiatives, whether that's the state innovation models that are going on, um, or the IOM work through the round table, and we could go on and on. Um, so uh, importantly, there is no intent for our collaborative to become the one and only collaborative. It's really, in fact, let's let everyone follow their passion, um, but let's try to be aware of and coordinate with all those initiatives so we're all moving in the same direction. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, yeah, and th thank you, Paul. And I, I, I would just add on to that. I think that's one of the discussions we continue to want to have with the group is what essentially what's our the sweet spot, or if you will, the unique contribution of this collaborative. And there's quite a bit of discussion around that. So we're uh, eager and excited to hear uh, more on your thinking on that. Um, so the next slide, um, if you will, it, um, sorry, um, I'm having a little trouble with uh, advancing this. I think I've got it here now. So the next area of a strategic map is a critically important component. And it's already in our existing map, but we've further refined this. This is what we refer to as the cross-cutting strategic priority. If you will, it's the base of the strategic map. Everything within these cross-cutting areas should roll up and support the overall strategic priorities and the central challenge. We spent quite a bit of time discussing uh, these cross-cutting areas, so specifically to realign resources and create sustainable models to support integration. And again, we were looking at both internally focused and externally focused, and also to realign infrastructure to support integration and sustainability. And maybe before I move on to off of that slide, uh, Paul, do you want to add anything more on the cross-cutting? Yeah, I, I, the cross-cutting initiatives are really those things that we have to do across the entire map. And so I think they're very important, and they really become um, a consideration for all of us as we work on our different uh, subcommittees or groups. And so we'll move to the, um, this final slide uh, of the strategic map, which again shows you the new draft map. And, and I emphasize draft because it's actually through your calls, it's through our committee calls, it's through independent individuals looking at the map and giving us feedback that we really will get uh, the best um, map, final map to work on as we go forward in the next two years. Uh, and I'm not going to go into detail on each of those uh, particular uh, actionable areas. We can come back to that. I do want to remind people uh, that in our original strategic mapping work, and as we go forward on this, what we did and how the tracks of work committee got created 
the track for work committees were not just one column, like not just column A or column B or column C, but actually put pull out strategic actions across all of those areas. So workforce could be across all several areas, measurements, uh, success stories. So that's one way to look at them uh, look at that particular map. And at this point, what I want to do is go on to the next slide to kind of tee up some questions and then I'd like to turn to Paul and then uh, Tim Fallon uh, for some uh, additional comments. Um, just again, as Paul has indicated, we are in the vetting or input stage. We've had some detailed discussions already with some of the committees that we're already planning to meet before this call. We have additional uh, committee calls going on through uh, July. Uh, and then, uh, Paul, you may want to speak also to uh, our discussions around a coordinated or planning council because I would say what's critical that we want everyone to understand is that AFSA sees this as a shared collaborative uh, and really needs a collective um, wisdom of the group uh, as we move forward. So Paul, I'll turn it to you and then we can go to Tim Fallon. Sure. Thanks, Sharon. Um, for those, I'm sure many people on the phone have uh, been part of organizing and running collaboratives. And, and if you have, you realize there's a, a fair amount of work to organize. Uh, in this case, we have over 60 different organizations. Um, and really be sensitive to the needs of the organizations and make sure the collaborative is moving in a direction um, where people are benefiting from it. Uh, over the past year, um, much of that has fallen to our team at ASTO, um, and we have consulted the committee chairs. But we're feeling that, that this is getting large enough and moving along far enough now that it would be worthwhile to have a steering committee modeled as we do our, our other groups with, a, with primary care and public health, a few primary care and public health folks on it to make decisions as we go down the path of the collaborative. So for example, with, um, you know, we'll have to uh, finalize the strategic map. It would be nice to have just a, few, a group of a few people highly engaged to make those decisions um, together so that it's not just ASTO making a decision. In fact, it's a collaborative decision. Um, so that, that's really what we're asking uh, and will be asking is uh, very shortly to get a few folks together um, to plan out what would that coordinator planning council look like, how would we work uh, together um, to make sure we're meeting everyone's needs um, as we do a slight course correction with this new strategic map. Thanks, Sharon. Tim um, Fallon, I believe you're on. I think if you uh, hit six six, uh, if you could open up and particularly if you could bring in some of your wisdom of doing these strategic mappings and add any further guidance to us. <coughs> uh, thanks, Sharon. This is Tim. Uh, I I just want to maybe reinforce one concept that might be helpful for people as they look at what I'd call the the first version of the map and compare it to the second. And, and one of the things that we distinguish is the difference between a strategic map and a comprehensive map. And the difference is this. A comprehensive map is all of the things that the collaborative could do. A strategic map is more focused than that. And it emphasizes the few things that the collaborative must do that will make the biggest difference. And the reason for that needed focus is that the resources that the collaborative has are finite. And so it's a question of how to deploy those resources on the most important few things. And the reason I wanted to say that is because if you look at the first map with five strategic priorities and supporting objectives, I think it tends more to the comprehensive side and as we look to <clears throat> this recommended map, what you're seeing is that it's more focused. Now, there's ways in which that can be limiting, but hopefully I think one of the things that was a theme that was characteristic of the meeting was we need to narrow the focus on what's distinctive that this collaborative could do and that we could, make, that we could really do that would make the most or the biggest difference. And so 
it is not unusual for us to see that as a map is updated or as a first generation map which is on the left to the second generation map which is on the right, that it actually gets stronger focus. Now I think what <clears throat> so having said that, I think the feedback that we would really like on the call or after the call is for people to let us know in what ways they think the new map is on target, what issues and concerns that they might have, and as always, their suggestions and support for effective implementation. <clears throat> so Sharon, I think with that, I'll turn it back to you and so we can move to feedback. Tim, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to comment on one yep. other thing, and that is the difference, sure, between I'd be happy to. difference between strategic and tactical. Yes, okay. So thanks, Paul. So if you think of it this way, strategy and tactic, and sorry for the military analogy, but strategy and tactic originated as military terms. So tactic focuses on how you fight the battle. Strategy is which battles do you fight. And you could win every battle and be tactically strong, but if you fight the wrong battles, you could lose the war. Now let me bring that back to the map. So if you think of it this way, what the strategic map describes is what the collaborative needs to focus on. It doesn't yet break that down into how it's going to carry that out. That will be the work of the committees going forward, and it will also then be coordinated you know, under a coordinating structure like a steering committee. But I th so what often happens when people look at a map is they say, well, you know, this is fine, but, but how do we move forward? So once we once we agree on or once we finalize the updated map as a description of what needs to be done, it will have to be broken down into the tactics of how that's going to happen. And at the tactical level, we get into defining who needs to, you know, what are the key steps that need to be carried out, what are the outcomes that we're trying to achieve, what are the metrics, what are the deadlines, what are the accountabilities. So you're not yet seeing that on the new map, but it definitely will have to be it will have definitely have to be a guidance document for selecting those few areas that we're going to work on and then moving to the tactical level. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you, Tim. Uh, Paul, I'm thinking um, that perhaps you want to speak briefly to uh, the thoughts around uh, and discussion around uh, planning or um, uh, coordinating council, and then what I'd like to do is turn it to our chairs that are on the call to get their input. Well, sure. J just briefly, again, the, um, we're hoping to pull together a small group to think about this concept of a, of a planning group because um, many decisions are being made throughout the year, and uh, we would feel best if those decisions were made in a collaborative fashion. Um, and so the, the next step will be a few folks getting together, a few of the primary care and public health folks getting together, um, maybe six at most, uh, to say, okay, what direction do we want to take, you know, take this in? How do we best support the committee structure and the members of the collaborative going forward? So Sharon, I don't know if you had more than that you wanted to discuss, but we, we expect no, that I over the next couple months, probably by our next, by September, we'll um, have uh, finalized the map and should have um, this steering group in place. And there was some sensitivity, it's worth saying, that um, you know, this is a voluntary collaborative. People join a collaborative because they get out of it uh, and further their own individual and organizational needs at the same time they further that of the partners of the collaborative. So I don't want anyone to think that a steering committee would have any authority to tell anyone what to do or to tell any organization what to do. That's really not at all the spirit of it. It's more how do we organize ourselves to make sure that um, we are being as efficient and taking um, uh, the, the best, um, making the best of the opportunity for folks to get together. So I'm happy to answer any questions on that because I know that um, there, there was some concern about that term steering because uh, nobody likes to be steered. Thank you, Paul. Um, maybe we will come um, back to that and see what uh, questions we do have. But at this point, uh, perhaps I could ask, uh, and, and I will acknowledge um, that there are several uh, really critical partners that are 
on this call, and thank you for participating today, uh, and, and particularly uh, several of you that were involved in the strategic mapping in May and those that are new. So uh, th this is a great example of a learning community. Uh, at this point, uh, David Sunwell, I know you're on the call, uh, and David, you've been a real uh, advocate for the need to bring this strategic map back, back together as we look at it. I wonder if you could make some comments from your experience. Yeah, sure. I co-chair the Resources Committee or Work Group, I guess, Track of Work, with Judy Monroe, uh, the Deputy of the CDC. And um, it was very welcome for me to have go through these two days in May, just because over the past years we've convened our, our Track of Work every few months uh, on a conference call. It seemed like um, we were getting a little broad and, and kind of getting uh, overlap with some of the other groups. So I pushed for this uh, kind of regrouping and, and uh, looking at the strategic map again. And I think it was kind of tough sledding. And Tim, I don't know how, what you, if you'd, how you'd rank it with other efforts, but uh, we succeeded. I think at the end of the two days or the time, day and a half we were together to really uh, focus it more. It, it's a less cumbersome strategic map. I think it's more focused. And, and uh, it shows how successful it was in that Judy and I have since met, uh, and our work group has met, to revisit what happened at that time. And we're quite open to the notion that maybe we worked ourselves out of a job. We're not sure where the resources work group will now fit in this new map. And that of uh, something staff is working on now to figure out where the previous um, um, organization of the, the those working to implement the street strategic map, where they'll fall. Um, I just put in a plug for the importance of this. I mean, as a primary care physician and a public health official, uh, we can't do our jobs uh, as well alone as we can together. I've seen it o over the years, and I think time is just perfect with uh, trying to implement the ACA to, to get this integration moving forward. Uh, I've worked on an article with a doctoral level student here at the university we hope to have published this summer, which is impressive in, in that it provides an overview of the scope of efforts from payers to public health to uh, community to foundations. Uh, so there's some real momentum here, and I'm uh, pleased to be part of this, and I think we need to keep figuring out how to focus it so it will keep going forward. Great. Thank you, David. Um, I note that uh, Mike Berry is on the line, and although uh, and Mike is one of our co-chairs of the Value Proposition Committee, although Mike wasn't able to join us, he did have uh, a colleague uh, actually participate with us. Mike, would you uh, be willing to comment uh, and, and with some of your thoughts on the new map? Hello, uh, this is Mike. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. That worked. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Sharon. Um, as you said, I wasn't able to be at that meeting. Uh, Paul Bonta uh, was able to represent ACPM very well, and he had uh, very good things to say about the uh, strategic planning session. And we did have a subsequent call with our value proposition committee just last week, um, although we only had a, a small number of many members on the call, I think we had about three or four, there was some good discussion. And I think um, we, as a, at least as a, as a small group, uh, if not representative, I think we felt that the uh, strategic map, the emerging strategic map out of the second phase uh, was very good. We liked the focus. Um, we liked the, um, the strategies that were moving forward. And so I think we're, we're very anxious as a committee to see where um, our continuing work might fit in if indeed we do need to continue our work. We actually felt that the value proposition, probably more so than, than some of the other committees, is a, is a committee that, that really does need to continue its work. In fact, um, I think its work may become more, more crucial now as, as we get further into the process. And so we, we strategize a little bit about what might be some of the next things we could do and but we felt that we wanted to see where the strategic map was going to make sure that um, whatever, uh, whatever you know, new directions or deliverables that we propose for our committee will fit in with, with the new strategic directions. We have a few ideas about that. But, um, so 
again, that's just a, a short take on um, what we've done to this point, and we're looking forward to seeing uh, the, the map be refined and, and fleshed out into the kind of tactics level as uh, Tim was talking about. Thanks, Mike. Um, uh, we also have uh, Sharon Stanley ask a question in the chat box. Um, will all the committee meetings be suspended until they are reworked back into this next mapping version? And she also asked who will do the work of reassigning the committees. So I think what we're, the committees had regularly scheduled meetings. I think there's a couple more to go in which the map was presented. And we'd really ask that the committees consider um, this transition from the older map to the new map take a look at the work you've been doing and and really think about okay going forward what would we you know propose our work to be what would be our sort of committee charter going forward given the new direction not significantly different direction but the modified direction moving forward and then I think there would be a conversation about that um, we have had some uh, chairs say that they thought perhaps uh, their committee um, would might do best um, with um, a combining with another committee. Uh, there may be some errors where we need new committees. And so I think that would be done, again, in a collaborative fashion. Um, and really what the job of that um, coordinating committee would be is to have those conversations with the chairs um, to say, okay, wh what do you think about combining or do you feel like your work has, has come to a conclusion or what direction would you like to go in now? Um, so. Um, I think we also though, want to be conscious of, of the bandwidth and how much time and energy people have. Um, so we don't want to try to support more subcommittees than, than can be supported. Um, so is that, uh, I hope uh, I, that helps answer the question, Sharon. And uh, if anyone else has questions about that, happy to take one more shot at it. Paul, perhaps at this point we uh, I, I, we do want to uh, hear from uh, Yumi Jarris. I think she's the other um, uh, committee chair that's on uh, the com um, the call. And then maybe what we should do is open it up for uh, a, a open discussion. I do see that uh, David Stevens is going to be able to speak also. So uh, Yumi, anything you would like to add from? the workforce perspective, although I don't believe your group has had a chance to meet, but perhaps from your own experience at being at the mapping meeting. Um, hi, Sharon. This is Yumi. Can you hear me? Yes, Hello? great. Thanks. Yes. Okay, great. I did the 6-6. Six, six. <laughs> um, I think it's an exciting opportunity for us, and especially um, now to have Donna Peterson on board. Um, I'll let Donna actually speak a little bit more about um, some of the efforts that we'll be actually partnering with ASPPH. ASTO will partner with ASPPH to um, work on an expert panel that Donna is um, organizing under the Framing the Future Task Force umbrella. Um, so, and this is on workforce development, and several members of our committee, our workforce committee will be on that. Actually, Paul Halverson, who is on the committee, Paul, are you on the call? I don't know if he is, um, will be co-chairing the committee from the ASPPH side, but he is also on our workforce committee. So their work then will be vetted with our, um, by our workforce committee, and we will then carry that effort on to do um, some work with the bi-directional integration of primary care and public health. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity, and that fits right in with the strategic math. Also, um, using professional meetings to, to promote, promote integration, I will let people know that um, Sharon, Denise, Koo, um, Malika Fair, who is also on our committee from the AAMC and I submitted a um, proposal to the um, it's the Association of American Medical Colleges, their annual meeting, and so we will be presenting the uh, on the collaborative as well as on our workforce committee. So I think we'll find we're finding a lot of ways to um, to work with the new map. Thank you, you mean Thank you. very very helpful. Uh, at this point, if maybe I could uh, call on uh, David Stevens. Um, and David, if you could 
um, explain your role in your organization, and, and uh, we were very pleased that David was able to join us. David? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Can. You can, okay, because uh, it's 6'6", six, six, I, I don't know. Um, yes, I'm David Stevens. I'm a um, family physician. I'm director of the Quality Center at the National Association of Community Health Centers, and I uh, also am a faculty member at the School of Public Health at GW. And there were a couple of things that were really helpful to us. Uh, first of all, I know all the organizations on the line have their own strategies. Uh, and I felt that what we developed was what I would call an umbrella strategy in that it not only encompasses what we want to do, it strengthens it. So that was one thing. Secondly, um, because not only because of the IOM report, but because we've entered a new phase where we're really – have redefining what's meant by the medical home or healthcare home because we see that as part of being a pr strong primary care practice is to be integrated with public health, community public health, and that we have a new cooperative agreement with the Center for Disease Control, something that we've never had. That a group like this could help in terms of an integrator role uh, as an integrator group in order to uh, accelerate and help us be able to fulfill this broadened view of primary care. And it fits very well with our infrastructure in that we've developed the Patient-Centered Medical Home Institute with our primary care associations and health center control networks in the states, and that we would be able to reflect what we've learned in a larger group here with them and to also facilitate similar relationships at the state and local level. So this worked with us in terms of the broad strategy, but also of our strategy and the opportunities, because I think one of the things that, that we really were happy about was leveraging opportunities already exist there that we see in the Accountable Care Act and some of the things going on in state health reform, um, and to have a larger group in order to work with and to learn from. And in fact, uh, we will be down in ASTO on Wednesday to further this conversation, and I, I think having um, this map is very helpful. Excellent. Thank you, David. Um, so at this point, what we'd like to do is really uh, open this up and make sure we have uh, continued discussion, questions, recommendations, of thoughts that you have, areas of clarification. So again, a reminder, you can do uh, press 6-6 six, six to unmute your phone, and then 6-3 uh, uh, will mute you back. Yeah, Sharon, uh, this is Terry Dwelly. Can you hear me? Oh, great, Terry. Yes, uh, thank you. And, and, and Terry, I'm sorry I didn't recall on you. Yes, please. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to, to um, just emphasize, I think, something that Paul touched on, the importance of the Coordinating and Planning Council. And I know we talked about that quite a bit at the meeting. But I think as, uh, you know, just from our, our perspective as states, as many of us are going through the accreditation process and we're developing this very broad state health improvement plans for our states, we are seeing the need in our states for all of these different strategies of the various organizations and agencies that have to do with health. Um, ha needing a, a smaller group, a coordinating planning council group, uh, that would be able to pull those together in some cohesive fashion for a state strategy. And um, I think that just kind of underlines the importance of doing that here. We have a lot of great work going on around the nation and in various groups uh, regarding integration, but there just doesn't seem to be a good way to pull that together. And I think the work of, of this group as well as that um, Coordinating and Planning Council can really provide a, a, a service for a national strategy. Thanks, Terry. And, and we should also uh, emphasize that, that this is not an attempt to create a coordinating group for all the different initiatives out there. It's really to coordinate this particular initiative. Um, but that would include reaching out to and um, collaborating with others and making sure we're aligned. So Terry, you didn't tell people who you were. Oh, I'm Terry Dwelly. I'm the state health officer in North Dakota. Sorry. <laughs> you have been forever. 
<laughs> and David would know because he was there before. <laughs> uh, I, I see that Carrie uh, Norwich has her uh, hand, uh, and, and Carrie was part of our uh, strategic mapping. So, Carrie, please, um, again, 6 6 to unmute. Can you hear me now? Excellent. Okay. <laughs> I was like, can you hear me? Um, yeah, I was um, part of the second strategic plan and the first. Um, and just going a little bit back to the discussion about the working groups, um, I think after the discussion of strategic planning, we realized that some of those working groups would have to shift focus a little bit to fit the new design. But one of the uh, possible goals um, for the new coordinating committee might be uh, to help those um, working groups possibly coordinate with each other or redesign their focus. Um, I would hate for all the momentum of those working groups to be lost simply because the new strategic plan uh, looks different um, because a lot of those areas are still valuable necessities uh, for moving forward. But that might be one of the first things that the, this coordinating council or whatever final name it's going to be given might be helpful with to really direct um, those working groups into kind of a new strategic area. Great. Thank you, Carrie. Great um, advice and input in an area that um, the coordinating council could definitely do. I'm not sure if, if everyone realizes that a, several months ago we started having the uh, co-chairs meet uh, in an attempt to do more of that work of coordinating and all uh, across work groups, obviously a need for ongoing uh, opportunities to build that coordination, uh, build on each other's work, but also be aware of, of each other's work. Other um, questions, um, comments? Uh, one point I'll um, bring up, and uh, unfortunately not a lot of our uh, federal partners were able to be on today's call. We did have a great uh, participation, as Paul uh, mentioned, uh, by our federal partners, as is evident in the um, slide that we showed earlier. Here, let me just see if I can quickly move it back. But one of the um, things the uh, federal partners have um, suggested is that we actually host a call to really uh, look at across our federal partners what are those opportunities to coordinate. So with CDC, HRSA, um, SAMHSA, Institute of Medicine, and uh, also um, uh, uh, with ARC. And, uh, and I do see that Jan's on. So again, we in, and uh, Jan and ARC uh, representation has been involved in the earlier uh, work groups. So again, opportunities there. So uh, I don't know if any of our federal partners that are on want to speak uh, to that, or Paul, if you want to mention anything further. Well, I would like to, oh, if you okay. notice on the map there, um, it does address integration of behavioral health and primary care and public health, which the old map didn't. And really want to thank uh, SAMHSA for raising that, that issue up um, during the uh, strategic mapping process. And, SAMHSA had some very high-level people attending, and um, I think for all of those us who have been in primary care, it was a, uh, oh yeah, you're right, it needs to be on there. <laughs> so um, again, thanks to SAMHSA as well as the other federal partners who, who joined us. Uh, and Paul, I, I realize I um, uh, did not uh, mention and, and should have uh, CMS and CMMI Although uh, they weren't able to participate in the strategic mapping, uh, I'll particularly note that Bill Tecklevin has been actively involved in several of our committees. Uh, so again, uh, a, a, an arm of our federal partners that absolutely needs to um, be involved as we uh, work at coordinating this work across all entities, but uh, particularly with our federal partners. Bill, I'm not sure if you want to um, add anything to that. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I've had a wonderful opportunity to be part of those. Um, uh, am, am I coming through? Yes. Tell us who you are, Bill. Too. Uh, that is Bill Kassler uh, from CMS, the Innovation Center. And uh, 
former ASTO alum. Uh, there's no question that this is such an important uh, issue um, that the first strategic map was a, a real innovation and that this second map takes it further. Um, I, I did have two comments. Um, one, and I know that ASTO is working in the background to try to fix this, um, but I don't think this is going to be as successful as it could um, without an intimate engagement um, with the payers. Uh, and I, I know my agency is, uh, is involved, but the private payers um, and health systems need to be um, yeah, engaged in this. My second comment would be about the map itself. And, you know, maps are metaphors. Um, they're great two-dimensional representations, um, but um, it, it, I think it's missing uh, something which Sharon uh, – described earlier, which is what is the unique role of ASTO uh, and this collaborative vis-a-vis -vis all of the heavy list lifting programmatically and policy-wise of the various different players. And as I look at the map, I see the third column, and, and it's not in front but I, I, uh, of us, but I recall that the third column is where I think the meat of what this collaborative is trying to do um, w with regards to uh, the convening. And I look at the first two columns, and while the ASTO collaborative may be seeking to influence them, those lifts in the first two columns are really our separate organizations. And if there was some way to make that strategic map a little bit more complex, maybe add a little topo to the map um, uh, to, to indicate, you know, that the drivers um, are A and B, and the leverage points for this collaborative are C, um, that may help because I think that the challenges that we had in the first year of this with several of the working groups is we really struggled as to how to pinpoint our activities and, and what were the leverage points that we could physically do with no staff and, and, and not a lot of resources. And, and I think if we kind of think that through a little bit more operationally, that, that might help um, charge the work groups w with more clarity. Yeah, it's a good point, Bill. Let me, let me first address your first and then quick question. When we did the original strategic map, you may recall, for those of you there, that Reed Tuxen of United Health co-chaired it well, with me, and that also Kaiser Permanente was in the room. So we did have insurers at that, that point. Reed has moved on from United, but I, I absolutely agree with you, and I, I think there was general agreement in the mapping session that we do need payers in the room since they are so influential and have leverages of, levers of their own. Um, I, I think I want to spend more time thinking about your column A and B and then versus column C, and, and I think uh, my initial response is that, that there's, you know, you're, you're, there's something there really to think about, um, um, and I haven't processed it fully yet, but I, I think I'm going to agree with you after I think more about it. But I, I see there's several levels, uh, levels to a collaborative. The first level is just getting together um, primary care and public health to start talking and cross some of the cultural divides, the language divides, and, and develop a working relationship with each other. And I think we've come a long way in that. A second part of the collaborative is to create that mutual awareness of what the different partners are working on um, so that, one, we're moving in the same direction, but also so that there can be cross-pollination. And, and I, uh, I know that that is happening now. We're, we're asked those working with partners we haven't worked as extensively with before, like the AMA and AAFP, um, where, um, like, uh, Yumi from Georgetown Medical School is working with uh, ASPPH. That wouldn't have happened before. And, and there's other examples like that. So it is spreading out from the collaborative to our regular working lives. The third piece, which is probably the hardest, um, is to actually do, the, do actual work and innovation as a working group. Um, not all collaboratives hit that level. Um, some do, and, and in some areas we will. So for example, the Resources Committee did put out a document um, about resources needed, and that's now been published uh, on our webpage, and it's published as part of uh, the Duke de Beaumont CDC playbook. 
Um, and I do know that uh, uh, Donna Peterson and Terry Dwelly and Yumi Jaris have been talking about um, a smaller work group that they may be able to pull together. I think Yumi may have mentioned that before. So to me, there's those three levels. One is you know, crossing the cultural and language divides. Two is that mutual awareness and engagement in each other's work. Um, and the third is actually putting out products from the collaborative. Uh, thank you, Paul and, and Bill. Thank you for your uh, thoughtful comments. W one of the things I just building on uh, one aspect of what Bill was mentioning is that work with payers and the health system. Actually, that's a comment we've gotten from a few of the committees as we presented er the earlier an earlier version of this. Is you know um, should it be focused just on primary care, public health? or should it be on the health system? The way we've discussed that to date, and, and to see if this resonates for people, is that th this uh, collaborative was started, obviously, uh, with the basis or the platform of the Institute of Medicine report specific to primary care and public health uh, collaboration uh, to improve population health. Uh, I think the reality as we've done this work is that you can't do this work without other parts of that health system, be it payers. Uh, we have quite a bit of talk at the strategic mapping about work with hospitals and community needs assessment. So I just wonder if other people have thoughts, or reactions, or comments to that. Sharon, this is David. I, I have. Um some reservation about making this so broad as to talk about health systems, but I've frequently run into the notion that um, it may be not limited to primary care but clinical care, because it seems like these principles of public health uh, practice we'd like incorporated into all clinicians to the extent we can. I know there are some that are so subspecialized it wouldn't maybe apply, but I think most people caring for patients uh, the clinical aspects and public health are relevant. Uh, David, thank you for that comment. And I'll mention that um, Dr. Ted Wimpo, um, former alum uh, show from uh, Ohio, actually mentioned that also, and that when he was out in the state really doing this work, he was also using the term clinical care, clinical providers. Yes, yeah, Sharon, this is Carrie again. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the payer issue, I would say that if we really um, delve down into the depths of the successes, many of those true successes actually have involved at their own level in their own area, uh, multiple or different types of payers. Um, there's a lot of innovative grants now in Washington State um, that are a lot of the principles are in you know, integrating primary care public health into some of those strategies as well. Um, I guess I'm not quite sure when the question is we have to involve payers uh, into the collaboration. Many of those payers are part of the partners, and I wasn't quite sure, I can't remember who it was that mentioned that, um, what you actually meant by involving them more, or perhaps it was just involving them differently. Yeah, I can just give you an example of, of what we uh, what occurred for in Vermont, where um, a couple of us had been before, and that is in looking at what was called the Vermont Blueprint. One of the things we looked at was creating uh, medical homes in the communities and really advancing them, and we were able to work with the payers to differentially uh, pay providers based on their level of NCQ accreditation as a, a primary care home because it's, it does take an investment on the part of the providers, um, and the insurers were willing to reward them uh, for achieving higher levels of medical homes. So that, to me, was an example of a very positive partnership with the insurers. In addition, the insurers agreed to collectively support community uh, care teams rather than each of them having their own utilization review, social work, nurses in the community. They, they co-funded teams to work with the medical homes. So to me, that's the kind of innovation we probably look for. Yeah, and, and there are there are practices all across. I mean, Washington State does a lot of that as well. Right. Um, this is David Stevens. I think sometimes when we what we're really talking about, I think, is 
the payment method, and that given that that B section there, depending on what the um, opportunities are, there's usually a payment methodology that goes along with it, which may drive a different kind of integration than another. And what Paul is saying is, is that in Vermont, there were given the payment method that was using, there was opportunities for further integration. I know from talking to my colleagues in Massachusetts where the state is planning to incentivize mental behavior health integration with primary care. There's probably a lot of others there. So I think, I think saying payer might be, we need to involve payers, but it's really how does the payment policy help support this further or accelerate this further integration. So that might be one of the areas um, for the working group that was sort of working on uh, making the business model or the business um, plan uh, could incorporate as part of the strategic plan is what information do payers need, how to incentivize them to support this kind of collaborative work. Yes. And also certain payment methods like capitation versus just pay for reporting offer different kinds of opportunities for that integration. Good. Well, thank you. This is, I tell you, this is just exactly why uh, these calls are so important, is, is having this dialogue back. We're, we're down to the last uh, couple of minutes. Paul, uh, any um, final comments uh, from you and uh, also from any, anyone else on the call? Well, I'd like to say you know, thanks to everyone for getting on the call. This is great dialogue. Um, and please take a look at the strategic map. Consider how it works within your organization um, and whether it would make sense and you can align with it. And then any comments you would have, we'd appreciate hearing from you. And Sharon, and um, how would we get those back? Uh, on, on your slide in the presentation today, we actually have created a PCPH collaborative uh, email address, and you can send those comments to us. Obviously, for Paul and I, we're happy to um, speak with you or hear anything further. Uh, it, 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 and again, we'll be also taking this back through our committees to make sure we um, have gotten the rich input. Thank you. Well, very good. We want to thank everyone for getting on the call. Um, any final? Sharon, was someone making a comment? No, I think someone's oh, on background the, um, noise. Okay. Person unmuted. Yes. Okay. So good. Thanks, everyone, very much. And we will um, speak to you in your committees. And also, um, love to hear from you. PCPH Collaborative at ASTO.org. And then we'll be scheduling a follow-up call um, in a couple months. So have thank a you. good summer between now and then. All right. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude the conference for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your lines.